Good morning. Welcome, everybody. I love the sound of everyone coming in. Uh, this is good stuff. I'm Pastor Jacob Snowden. I'm, I uh, have the honor of preaching today, which means I have the honor of doing the announcements today, so that's why I'm before you. Uh, there are several announcements uh, in the bulletin, the first of which is a big thank you to everyone involved in any way, shape, or form with the Joseph production. Uh, show of hands, who was here for Joseph in any way? You walked in on a rehearsal, you bought tickets, you didn't buy a ticket, and you walked in anyway. This is good. So a big uh, heartfelt thank you to everyone involved with that. Uh, the Hope for All supply truck is in the parking lot today. If you have donations, if you don't like your shoes or something, I guess you can drop them off in there. Uh, that is there for you to make donations. Next week, you're going to be hearing some about this in the sermon uh, and definitely in the weeks ahead. We are kicking off officially our capital campaign next week, but uh, you have an opportunity to be a part of advanced leadership. If you want to know what that means, there will be home gatherings for you uh, where you can consider your role to play, your giving uh, for our Renew campaign. Um, and if you'd like to know more about that, we have home meetings. Some invitations have already been sent out. If you don't have one and you're still interested, mark that in the friendship pad uh, that that's something you're interested in, uh, or you can call the church office uh, to get an invitation there. Uh, that's important work. Uh, Jenna Clements passed away uh, yesterday, um, and so our prayers and thoughts and comfort are with the family. Uh, we want you to know about that. Her service will be a few weeks from now, so keep your eyes uh, open for that. If you see the family, be sure to give your condolences. Uh, there is a hungry dinner, Hungarian dinner, coming up this Friday. It's our senior, uh, our senior dinner, and if that's something you're interested in, uh, you don't need to be Hungarian. You just need to be hungry and, uh, and senior. So uh, if that's something you're interested in, there's a sign-up. You're welcome to do that. There are several announcements in the bulletin. If you want to go to Cuba, if you want to be involved with uh, children and family, there's tons of things you can do, uh, but I recommend that you read them on your own in the bulletin. I know you didn't come here to do that. You came here to worship God, so let's do that now. Our call to worship is from Psalm 66. Make a joyful noise to God, all the earth. Sing the glory of God's name. Give to God glorious praise. Say to God, how awesome are your deeds. All the earth worships you. They sing praises to you. Bless our God, O people. Let the sound of praise be heard. We went through fire and water, yet you have brought us to this nation.
God is always open to hearing from us, not only our praises, but also our confessions. Let us pray together. God, you see us through lenses of love and grace. We confess our lenses are often different and distorting. Forgive us when our love is narrow, our excuses are wide, our blaming is panoramic, or our gratitude is myopic. Help us to see that you catch us when we stumble. You guide us when things are blurry. Let us look to the future with a clear hope focused on you. Friends, there is good news in the gospel. God gives us the gift of vision that we might anticipate each day that has been made with hope and confidence in the unfolding of God's promises. When we have difficulties in our living that block our vision, God is right there, ever-present, always ready to refocus us, put us on the right path. We are loved and we are forgiven. Thanks be to God and hallelujah. I'd like to invite the children right over here. I have a story and something to give right over here. You can't tell with the microphone, can you? Come right over here. That means you. So today, uh, the title of my sermon is Renewed Vision. And I wanted us to think about the way we see things. There's lots of ways to change what we see. We can look through a microscope to see things that are really small. We can look through a telescope to see that things are really far away. We can look uh, with mirrors to see things that are behind us. There's lots of ways to see things. There's a story uh, that's not in the Bible, it's about the Bible. And I like that story very, very much that tells us that we have to keep our eyes open. And the story goes like this. When God was creating the world and he wanted to send light into the world, he had pure godly light, divine light, or God's light. And whenever he wanted to send that out into the world, he put it in these jars, but the jars weren't good enough to hold the light when God sent it out. And so as those uh, jars were holding the light, they broke apart and the light went everywhere. But we don't know quite where all of that light is. It's hidden in the broken pieces of those jars. It's broken in us and it's broken in uh, all the world, in the, the chairs and other people. And how bad 
that these things would be broken. So we are given a very special task. We are supposed to repair the world. If you see that picture, there's a big rift in it, right? And uh, we need to repair the world. And the way we do that is that we look for the pieces of that divine light, God's light, in everything that's around us, in people, in places, in things, in all sorts of ways. And it's hard to see what that light from God is because sometimes it gets mixed with all sorts of other things. Fortunately, I have something very special to give all of you that's going to help you look for all of this godly light. Can you guess what it is? I have some sunglasses for each and every one of you. And uh, I think they're pretty cool, but I think they are way too small for my big old head. But I bet they will fit all of you. So I want you guys to take one, pass it around, okay? And then, uh, can you help? Can you pass some around? Oh, you're a good helper. You want to help? Okay, take one and pass some around. Okay. You want to help? All right, you take some and pass them around. I got all helpers, no takers. You need some more. All right. You can take any color, and maybe you can trade later or something. They all help you see the divine light, I promise. I asked Amazon about it, and they said they were good. <laughs> you still need one? More over there, more over there, all right. Hand them out. You're such a good helper. Can you hand out some more? We need some over that way. All right. So we're going to say a prayer, and then uh, some of you are going to go with Miss Holly to some Sunday school classes, and some of you might worship in here with the rest of your families. And in all ways, whatever you do, I hope that we can look for the divine light in each person that we meet and everything that we do. We learn to look for how we repair the world by collecting all this godly light. Okay, let's say a prayer. If you don't have sunglasses, we can get them after the service too. Let's pray. Okay, I bet you can find some pink ones after the service. I'll help you out in just a little bit. Okay, let's pray. Gracious and loving God, we thank you for sending your light to the world, a light that guides us in the ways of faith, hope, and charity. In all things, no matter the circumstances, help us to keep our eyes open for the things that you're doing and the ways that you're leading us. Help us to do that by your grace and your light. These things we pray in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Yes.
a beautiful piece of music to add to our worship. Please join me in the prayer of illumination. Dear Lord, open our hearts to receive your word, our minds to reveal its meaning for our lives, and our hands to practice what we have received from your message. Amen. Our first reading this morning is from the book of Corinthians, chapter 13, and today I will be reading from the King James Version of the text. Though I speak with the tongues of men and angels and have not charity, I am become as sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. Charity suffereth long and is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up, doth not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil, rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth, beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Charity never faileth, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. When I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now, we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know even as I am also known. And now abideth faith, hope, charity, these three, but the greatest of these is charity. This ends our first reading. There's a microphone in here somewhere. Our second reading is from Deuteronomy 34. Listen for the word of God. Then Moses went up from the plains of Moab to Mount Nebo, to the top of Pishgah, which is opposite Jericho. And the Lord showed him the whole land, Gilead as far as Dan, all Naphtali, the land of Ephraim and Manasseh, all the land of Judah as far as the western sea, the Negev, and the plain, that is the valley of Jericho, the city of palm trees, as far as Zoar. The Lord said to him, This is the land of which I swore to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, saying, I will give it to your descendants. I have let you see it with your eyes, but you shall not cross over there. Then Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab at the Lord's command. He was buried in a valley in the land of Moab, opposite Beth Peor. But no one knows his burial place to this day. Moses was 120 years old when he died. His sight was unimpaired, and his vigor had not abated. The Israelites wept for Moses in the plains of Moab 30 days. Then the period of mourning for Moses was ended. Joshua, the son of Nun, was full of the spirit of wisdom because Moses had laid his hands on him, and the Israelites obeyed him, doing as the Lord had commanded Moses. Never since has there arisen a prophet in Israel like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. He was unequaled for all the signs and wonders that the Lord sent him to perform in the land of Egypt against Pharaoh and all his servants and his entire land, and for all the mighty deeds and all the terrifying displays of power that Moses performed in the sight of all of Israel. 
The word of the Lord. God of all hope, renew our vision by your light, guiding us in the ways of faith, hope, and charity. Amen. Moses was 120 years old when he died. His sight was unimpaired and his vigor had not abated. I'll say, he climbed a mountain when he was a dozen decades old. I'm looking for the chair that goes on my stairs and carries my old behind right up to my bedroom. Moses' story is about vision. Without closing his eyes to violence, he saw the suffering of his people in Egypt. With focus and attention, he saw the burning bush that was not consumed. Now we read, with sight unimpaired, he sees the panorama of the promised land. As we turn our gaze to the life and death of Moses, I wonder what vistas might come into our view if we look closely at this story. Deuteronomy 34 is not only the account of the end of Moses' life, it's the end of the Torah. The whole of the law, the most important scripture in Judaism. And I'll tell you, this is not a happily ever after ending. Since Genesis 12, God has been trying to put a people in the promised land. In the Woodsmen's Study Bible, I found a copy in that cabinet right back there, that task has taken 174 pages. And those aren't War and Peace pages or Harry Potter, Lord of the Rings pages. Those are Bible pages. The entire Gospel of Mark is 19 pages. Second and Third John and Jude are two and a half pages. What I'm saying is this is a generations-long saga of trying to get to the promised land. And it's taken a while. But now, with Moses on the mountain, how sweet it is to take in that view. But the, the semi-sweet news, the bittersweet news, is that Moses doesn't make it to inhabit the promised land. He sees it, but he's buried in the Moabite desert, in an unmarked grave, and no one to this day, the writer tells us, knows exactly where. Now, I like this story because it's a complex look at faith, and it matches the complexities I feel in the life of faith. On the one hand, God is giving a gift to Moses. What a blessing to see the awaited promised land. But what a blow not to inhabit it. Can't you just imagine that for every time the Israelites had complained about a sweeter life back in Egypt, that they had grown tired of eating the same old manna day after day for years, that Moses could taste just a little more milk and a little more honey on his tongue? What else could keep him moving forward? And while this is the first time Moses put his eyes on the land, I suppose he had seen it in every nook and cranny of his imagination. Every daydream, every fantasy, and every thousand-yard stare, there was a glint in his mind's eye of this vision from the top of Mount Nebo. Moses' story is about vision that sustained Israel through the wilderness. A vision was all that Moses had. The milk and honey never passed through his lips. The literal land of promise never caked on his sandals. And as much as we like the happily ever after ending where Moses lives out his days with grapes dangling in his mouth from the land of plenty, there is beauty in this ending too. Moses' uh, task was to lead Israel to the promised land, and he did just that. Lest a shrine be built to Moses where people nostalgically look back to the days and ways of old, we read that a mournful people had to renew their vision and turn to Joshua if they were to have a future in the land. Now, it's not the case that we personally come to possess everything for which we hope and dream. Martin Luther King Jr. shared his vision, his dream, on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial where the sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners would sit together at the table of brotherhood. But in a few short years, he claimed that his dream, his vision, had turned into a nightmare. On April 3, 1968, King spoke in Memphis at the Masonic Temple and delivered a speech entitled, I've Been to the Mountaintop. 
He imagines he's granted a bird's eye view of all of history. He flies over Athens and Aristotle, Rome and its Republic, Renaissance Italy, Luther nailing his 95 theses to the door. But if given the choice, he said, he would choose to be dropped in his own time to see the movement of people around the world standing up for freedom and equality. And the speech ends with this reference to the very passage that we've been thinking about this morning. He says, we've got some difficult days ahead, but it really doesn't matter with me now because I've been to the mountaintop and I don't mind. Like anybody, I would like to live a long life. Longevity has its place, but I'm not concerned about that now. I just want to do God's will. And he's allowed me to go to the mountain, and I've looked over, and I've seen the promised land. I may not get there with you, but I want you to know tonight that we as a people will get to the promised land. It was that next morning that he was assassinated. So no, we don't always take possession of our hopes and dreams. But if we don't possess, if we can't possess, can we learn from Moses on the mountain and Martin in Memphis how we persist and pursue God and God's work faithfully? The complexity of this semi-sweet sight of promise in Moses and in Martin suggests that faithfulness is just as much about vision and promise as it is about accomplishment. It's good to reach for new heights and a brighter future, even if fear of letting go of the pieces of the past stops us. Robert Dunham preached in a sermon entitled Unmarked Memories and the Road Ahead, and he says that without a sense of history, we lose our identity, but freezing our history can deny us a future, a future which God intends a road which God has set before us. This week's sermon title is Renewed Vision. Renew is the theme for the capital campaign at Woods that will officially kick off next Sunday. But before you start thinking about dollars and cents, nuts and bolts, I want you, and the church needs you, to take in a broad panoramic vision of your thoughts of church renewal. I want you focused on faith, not finances, even if those things are connected. When you imagine the church at its best, what comes to your mind's eye? If we are standing on Mount Nebo, what promising places do you see? Not just for yourself, but for generations to come. Where might you see the Tikkun Olam, the repair of the world, as you find God's light shining around you? What role will you play as we do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly with God? I was once asked in a seminary class how many bushes I thought God set afire before Moses finally realized that one of them wasn't completely burned up. How long was God trying to get Moses' attention to share with him a divine mission and vision? How long did Moses have to stare before he realized that something special was happening there? For you, what bushes have been burning for you and you thought to yourself, I need to turn more attention there? How can we capture the light and the vision in education, worship, counseling and care, child development, family support, and not just in the things we already do, don't you have a vision for the things we have yet to do? I love this quote from Simone Weil, who published a journal called Waiting for God. And there she said, attention is the highest form of generosity. And absolutely unmixed attention is prayer. If we turn our mind toward the good, it's impossible that little by little the whole soul will not be attracted thereto, in spite of itself. This Sunday, turn your unmixed attention to God's light and God's leadership. Where do you see it? Where is God leading this church into the future? 
And even if we wander through the wilderness, because that happens sometimes, how can we trust and entrust that this place will be full of faith, promise, hope, and charity? Now, there's lots of ways that our attention can be distracted. When Moses parted the Red Sea to lead Israel out of Egypt, I'm convinced someone, probably in the back of the line, was staring at the ground and complaining. Couldn't Moses pick a less muddy way? Did we have to go right through the water? The way to the promised land might be muddy. Manna every day might be tiresome. I think maybe hearing about pledge cards will be. Yet little by little, because of Moses' faithful focus on the future, he sees his way through the mud, through the mire of the present, towards the promised land. If we can focus on the light and the good that's happening in our midst, I have no doubt Woods will be a place of promise, not just for this generation, but for generations to come. So I've said everything I want to say, but let me highlight just a couple of things. First, every generation needs renewed vision. Nostalgia for life in Egypt and life with Moses didn't put people in the promised land. The people mourned the past, but ultimately they had to turn to Joshua. Woods has done wonderful things in the past, but without renewing our vision collectively and sharing your personal visions, we're frozen in the past instead of faithfully following God into the future. Second, in the words of the prophet Mick Jagger, you can't always get what you want, but if you try sometimes, you get what you need. For all that Moses did, he didn't inhabit the promised land. Jesus prayed in Gethsemane for the cup of suffering to pass by him, but it didn't. We might have dreams about separate, uh, we may have different visions. I thought maybe some of you thought about separate private jets for Nancy, Susan, and me to do the Lord's work without baggage fees. <laughs> Yet this capital campaign is focusing on other things, which you should be happy to know. Uh, faithfully pursuing our visions is a semi-sweet task. So enjoy the sweetness and take comfort in all of the people around you and after you who will enjoy the benefits of your legacy of faith. Third, Moses pushed hard for the vision he had. He climbed a mountain at 120. The road ahead may be hard regarding the capital campaign or who knows what else the future might hold. But if we can trust that God is leading us forward, then the task is simple enough. Keep your eyes open so that in time we might see what wonders God has in store. We look through a glass darkly, but have hope that one day we'll see fully, we'll be known fully, we'll be seen, and we will see face to face. God, open our eyes, open our hearts, that in all things we see the ways that you're leading us. Give us faith to pursue it, no matter what. This we pray in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.
Pastor Jacob asked me to share a little bit about why I like giving to Woods. And I like the opportunity because it gives me a chance to be part of a broad community. This morning we have uh, the Ministry of Hope for Anne Arundel County, but we're also honoring our commitment to Malawi, a place I may only ever see from a mountaintop, but I can have a hand in contributing. Please join me in the prayer of dedication. Lord, as we dedicate these gifts to your service, let us remember to dedicate our lives to you as well. Fill us with faith, hope, and charity, both in our giving and in our actions at home and abroad in the world. Amen.
Let's go to God in prayer. You have been our refuge and strength from one generation to another. Draw near to us, we pray, O God. Help us to see with your eyes. Today, we pray for the leaders of your church. We pray you give our lay leaders, deacons, elders, and pastors faithful and loving hearts. May we be empowered to live your vision, to share faith, hope, and charity with those in need. And we pray for this world so broken and so bare. How this world needs your church. Please allow us to welcome our community in the name of Jesus. May our service be an anthem to your glory. May these buildings be a shelter for those in pain. And may our children find their true home within these walls. We remember the sons and daughters of this congregation who serve in the armed forces, many very far away. And we pray for their protection and their safe return. We lift up first responders and, and thank you especially for those who came so quickly on Friday in response to the emergency. For flooding victims and those impacted by gun violence in our own community and elsewhere. Help us, oh God, help us to stop this madness. We pray for your creation. You brought forth the mountains. You gave birth to the land and the earth. Please give us the desire and will to care gently for all that you have made. Make us kind and generous stewards. Today, we lift up our Guatemala mission team. Please be with Gail Gillespie and Pat Johnson and Cher Atkinson and the rest of the team from Baltimore Presbytery who will travel on our behalf and will teach us what they have learned about the situation with immigrants in, in the Americas. God be with all of those who have been forced to leave their homes for whatever reasons. We pray for the people of Syria. We pray for people in our own community who are experiencing homelessness and especially for our mission partners at Hope for All in the life-giving work of helping, helping transition from homelessness to a permanent home. We lift up those in our church family who are in need of healing, O oh God, and pray particularly for Ann and John Veach. For Ron Sander and Jeff and Linda Norris, for Charlie Crater and, and John Hunt, Jean Campbell and Bob Downey, Jenna Kinsley and Mary McCaslin and Don Rowland and Charlene Van Meter. Be with Janet Wallace and, and Marie Shelton, Joan Rohrbach and Alan Loopfer. God, we pray your healing mercies for Art Johnson and Carolyn Decker and Joe Birchfield. For all the saints, O oh God, for all the saints who from their labors rest. We pray particularly this morning for the Clements family, for Barry, and for all of the, the family as they remember and give thanks for Jenna's life. Be with the family and friends of Mary Bridger, as well as the family and friends of Ruth Case. We pray for Barb Lynn and family, and we remember with gratitude her mother Jan. We pray for the Messick family on the death of their son, Ricky. Be with Mary Jane and Rick and all of their loved ones, and also for the Rogie family, as we remember with gratitude Carl's extraordinary life. Love lives beyond the grave. Give these families vision of resurrection life that will sustain them through difficult days. We give you thanks and praise for little Ava Ray Kiewit and, and Charlie Sue Haley receiving the sacrament of baptism this morning at the 11 o'clock service. We thank you for the children and youth of this congregation. Help them and help us 
to come alongside them as they grow in wisdom and favor with God and with their peers and neighbors. God, your love never fails. It is new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Help us to live as we pray in the manner that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom comes. Thy kingdom that is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, there's a Stephen minister available to you. Fred Rogers says, what is mentionable is manageable. Sometimes you just need someone to mention things to. A Stephen minister is just such a person. Cher is just such a person. Someone who listens, someone who cares. The elder of the day is Steve. If you have questions about Woods Church, how to join, how to be involved, how to give money to our capital campaign, uh, <laughs> How quantum computing works. You can ask him anything. Uh, Steve is our elder of the day. This is twice. I thought he would do this.
Thank you, Steve. We're out three minutes early. I don't know what that does for your appreciation, but. <laughs> for the benediction. I've seen a picture from atop Mount Nebo. One of you uh, shared it with me after your trip to the Holy Land, and it didn't look like it was flowing with uh, much other than sand drifts. Yet Moses saw something there. He saw promise and a future. What do you think of? What do you see when you think about the future of Woods Church? How do you see promise? How do you see a future? As you go, go with your eyes wide open. Go with faith, go with hope, go with charity. And in the, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, as always, go in peace. Amen. Amen.